and Light Christian Church. SALT and Light is an acronym. If you look, turn to the back of the bulletin, we have it there every week. And the L stands for to look like Jesus. And, um, and we live in a time that it's, it, I heard this comedian this week, he, a Christian comedian. He's pretty funny. And he says, my sister has on her wallet at her house the verse, no, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. And he said, yeah, no, he goes up to sister, no, sweetie, it's a great verse, but that verse doesn't really pertain to your, you know, Cuisinart breaking. Uh, he's like, no, we have these verses. And when Paul was writing this stuff, like, they were beating him with rods, trying to stone him to death. And then we have these verses up when we face our issues, thinking somehow they're huge issues. And the comedian's talking about, let's look at what Paul's facing. Let's look what we're facing. He's like, should we really be quoting this verse for because our microwave broke or something went down? He said, we, we tend to sort of not really live in the realm of God. We live in the realm of our problems. And instead of living like Jesus. And I'm like, I'm laughing. Of course, everyone's cracking up because there's truth in what he's saying. And that's what makes a good joke is when there's truth in the joke. And, and I'm like, yeah. And it's like, do we know what it means to look like Jesus? And, I mean, we have these wonderful verses about Jesus being a light. And if you go through the Gospels, it's amazing how many verses there are about Jesus being light. You know, I just put a few of them down like, uh, you know, Matthew 5, 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see the good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. You know, reflect Jesus. Uh, you no, know, John 1, 5, the light shines in the darkness. The darkness has uh, overcome it. Uh, we, you know, um, John 8, 12, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have a light of life. And following Jesus being like Jesus is we're not in darkness. We're always in light. We should never be in darkness, which means we should see things clearly. And, but we have trouble doing that. And I, I heard this interesting uh, uh, stat that's out there that this guy was talking about. And he said, in most denominations, numbers are dropping. There's fewer people in denominations today than there has been like in 100 years. There's fewer people going to church today than like in 100 years. And then he said, you'd be surprised at what denomination is growing. So you have like the Southern Baptists, they're dropping, Methodists are dropping, all those are dropping. He goes, the one that's growing, he goes, will surprise you, and it did. The Amish, the backward people, the people without technology are increasing in number. The most uncompromising people are increasing in number. Like if you go there and say, well, I don't like your dress code, they're like, there's the door. <laughs> well, no, I don't, no, when I come home, I want to turn on the television and get on my cell phone. They're like, there's the door. Well, I think women should have a different role. They're like, there's the door. And they're like, well, you know, I see marriage this way. And they're like, there's the door, because we're not changing our belief system for you. It's what they believe. It's what they believe to be true. So they're living by what they see God saying and living by his word. And as I look, think about it, they are all in. I mean, if you're Amish, you are all in. You're not partially in. Your toe's not partially in the water. You are completely in or you're out. And what's fascinating, too, is the children, uh, the children once they hit 18, I forget the name of it, they can go out into the world. And they, so they go out into technology and they go out and see this. They see 90% of them return. To that the way of life they they go in the world of all this stuff and all this craziness and they choose to go back and i'm not saying the amish are perfect but i love their attitude of being all in and uncompromising it made me think how many christians are truly all in because we got christians saying they're all in but living with people we have Christians saying they're all in, but starting to grab on to definitions this world is saying for gender and so forth, which is wrong. We have Christians saying they're all in, going to new definitions of marriage. I mean, how can you we say you're a Christian? I mean, you're not all in. And the reason we're not all in is they don't believe Jesus is correct. Now, they may never say it, but it's true. If we're not all in, we think Jesus is wrong and another way is better. That's what we're saying. 
You know, are we ready to be all in? And, and that's a fascinating thing. And then I was listening to Francis Chan talk about this. And he's, he came to Christ when he's like in high school. And he said, I was reading the scripture. He goes, I read Acts. Everyone needs to know about Christ. So I got out my yearbook. And, I, and he goes, I was going to my senior year. I, sorry, I started calling every senior to tell them about Jesus Christ. Because they need to know Christ. He said, I know this may be crazy, but I may never see you again. So since I may never see you again, I need to tell you about Jesus. He said, then I started you know, reading about how, well, someone will say, Lord, Lord. And Christ will say, I, even though he said, Lord, Lord, I never knew you. So he started talking to Christians, saying, you know, you, it's not enough to say you're a Christian. Your, your life has to reflect it. It has to show it. And, said, and then I, I read about how if you had the faith of a mustard seed, you can move a, tell a mountain to move, and it will move. And, and said, so I went to my, he goes, literally, I went to my bedroom. I closed the door. He said, I had pencil on the, t- I said, Lord, move the pencil. I know you can move it. Move the pencil. He said, and the pencil didn't move. I'm trying, why is the pencil not moving? And then if you ask for anything, my name will be done. He says, I prayed for people, people to be healed, and they weren't healed. I'm like, Lord, what's going on? This is supposed to be true. He said, then I went to Bible college. And when he said that, I'm like, okay, this is not going to turn out well. Uh, he says, I went to Bible college, and I talked to the professor. I said, you know, why is this not happening? He goes, oh, you're taking it too literally. He said, okay, what parts am I supposed to take and not take literally? And he said, in that sensational side of me, the side that really expected God to come and intervene, slowly started disappearing. And I'm like, oh, that's why when I asked for people to get healed and they didn't heal, that's why I was taking too literally. And when I asked the, the the, uh, the uh, pencil moving it. I was taking too little. Oh. And so he's like, I missed the whole, like, that wasn't, too literal wasn't the issue. But that's just what they said. And he said, so I became this pastor, and I start trying to figure things out differently now, and I lost that side of me. And he said, and I always had a trouble with certain scriptures. I didn't know what to do with them, and you know, with tongues and stuff, and what do you do with it? And, you know, is that literal? Is it not literal? And I got this whole battle going in my head. He said, in one day, he was, I was reading 1 Corinthians 14, 24, and 25. He says, but if all of you are prophesying and unbelievers or people who don't understand these things come into your meeting, they'll be convicted of sin, judged by what you say. As they listen, their secret thoughts will be exposed, and they will fall to their knees and worship God, declaring, God is truly here. God is truly here among us. And I'm like, well, is this supposed to be literal? He said, but it also showed that every believer can prophesy in the name of the Lord. Now, talking about God and how great and how wonderful he is, it, it's not just made for the pastor or the music leader. It's everyone can do this. And if everyone's doing this, if everyone's all in on Christ, the prophesying in the name of the Lord, and non-believers will fall to their knees and say, God is real. And he said, I started realizing I had, was running my church the, the world's way where people with great leadership skills were in leadership and people with good financial skills were helping with the money. And he said, and I wasn't looking at people who may not have obvious skills. And he goes, that scripture says, but if all of you, but if all of you, he said, and how many people came and went from my church who I never saw? Because, you know, I, I went into the camp of being too, don't be so literal. Not realizing everyone can do amazing things for the Lord. And, and he said, I met with my elders and said, this is the church I want. This is who I want us to be. This is what I want us to do. Because was, that was also in the time where the church will make these, you know, we see the numbers are dropping, and the church's response is, well, how can we become more relevant? And, you know, and, you know how can we make our, our church more attractive to the non-believers? So let's start forming our church, you know, for non-believers, where Jesus defines the church, the gathering of believers, and we start trying to think, well, let's make a church for unbelievers, where God's definition of church is believers. And he's like, that's when it, I think it starts... Coming, when did Christ become so unattractive that we had to try something else? These are you know, pastors and leaders. Not only were they doing this, then they start selling it to other churches. You no, know, you can get more people if you can just you know be look more like the world. Now I think their intentions were good, but they lost sight of Christ and they saw the world. And it's like. 
we weren't all in because the goal became, okay, how do we get more? And, and Jesus is like, I'm not telling you to get more into your building. I'm telling you to look like me. And as you look like me, people will see me and will be drawn to me if you look like me, if your light shines. But we can't look like Jesus if we're not all in. If it's just something we do on Sunday or here and there. I mean, our marriages should reflect Jesus Christ. Our relationship should reflect Jesus Christ. We should be seen differently. Not because they're seeing us, but they're seeing Christ. And today, Jaden made a joke, and it was funny. And, but I'm like, oh, that's what goes with my message I'll use. He said, you know what we should do is make a trap door and get fog machines and start the fog up and then have you know, Pastor Jim come from underneath and rise up and, <laughs> and, and <laughs> fly. And, it, 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 it is funny. And, but then I was laughing at it too. I think about it. That problem is some churches have actually done that. And I'm like, oh, he's joking, but people have done that. We're all of a sudden, the pastor is the center. Oh, look at me. Look how great I am. Look how wonderful I am. You want to come here because of me. And Jesus is always like, no, I'm always the focus, not you. He said, and, but churches have done this, and people have gathered in the thousands to see this. And behold this, and you're like, oh my goodness. And I said, you know how strong a church is, is if the pastor leaves and the majority of the people leave, the church is based on the pastor and not Jesus Christ. And to be all in, it's funny, I was listening to a TED Talk, and it was really fascinating. Chris says, oh, I have that book. I'm like, okay, I'm going to have to read it now. But I'm already reading three other books. I've got to get to it. Um, but this woman was talking about, they're trying to figure out how... Who was going to succeed? And they went to West Point, and they went to this National Spelling Bee. And they're trying to see who would succeed, who would be the best. And they, she's using this incredible formula and, and scientists and all that stuff. And she's determined those who do the best are those with grit. The term is grit. And I'm like, fascinating. And she's starting to define it. But grit is a person with this tenacity in them who doesn't quit who doesn't look at today or tomorrow. They're looking at next week, next month, next year, and they know at times it's going to take a while to get somewhere, so they stay in it. They just keep going. And when they fail, they don't see it as failure. They see it as an ability to go to the next step and to learn and grow, and they are just tenacious, and they keep going. And the woman's talking about it, and I'm like, you're talking about Jesus. There is no better definition of grit than Jesus Christ. You talk about being all in, Jesus who leaves heaven becomes a man as a baby and can be crucified is a person who's all in and who does not give in, who's looking, people are looking to kill him, harass him, he doesn't quit. They want to stone him to death. He keeps going because he's seeing past the moment to the end of the game. And we quit so easily. And this woman's like, we can look at you, and she says, it doesn't matter your gender, it doesn't matter your, uh, what nationality you are, it doesn't matter your socioeconomic. Those were all irrelevant. Grit came just down to this personality trait. And so that's what we had to look at. So we didn't care about anything else. If they had grit, they were going to succeed. But grit people are all in. And, and it frustrates me that people always look at Jesus the wrong way, and they always make him this you know, this soft thing that walks around and quotes scripture and bless you and bless you. Jesus was tough as nails. I mean, he was amazing. He goes into the belly of the beast and he keeps going. I mean, I like the verse where I think it was in Judea and they're trying to stone him to death and he slips away and later on he says, we're going back to Judea and his disciples are like, but Jesus, they, they want to stone you there. And basically Jesus is like, yeah, what's your point? Well, we can't go back there. And Jesus is like, what's your point? We're going back there. He wasn't afraid to go back in to people who were going to stone him to death. I mean, we get in an argument with someone, and we see them at the grocery store. We go down a different aisle than they're down because we don't want to see them. And Jesus goes back into the place they wanted to kill him. Why? Because he sees past the moment, they need me. They need the message, and I'll go back there. And that explains why the disciples had so much grit. It's amazing, too, because we say, well, Jesus technically never failed, but he was 
next to it. I mean, one of his disciples betrayed him. Any leader was looking at his failure. Of course, it wasn't. It, Judas made a bad choice. Peter denies him. Thomas doubts him. But Jesus says, oh, these losers, let me trash this whole discipleship thing. He sees the power of it. He knows the power of it. And he keeps going forward. And it's like, man, Jesus, I mean, he was a man. He was tough. He was compassionate. He was loving. He was strong. And it's like, Jesus saying, yeah, be like me. Look like me. And we think, well, how in the world can that be done? And he goes to the extreme to show us that we can look like him or do what he's done. And that's where, basically, I guess that's my introduction. Here we go. Um, to John 14, uh, verse, starting verse 5. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know, we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father that will be, that, that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it's the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say, I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. He says, no, look at me. You've seen the Father. Now, that is enough. Jesus could just stop there, and that's enough. That is sufficient for all we need. But Jesus continues on. Now, they're asking the questions. They're not quite, these are his disciples who have been walking with them. They love him and he loves them. They're not quite getting it. And he goes further with it. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. Holy cow. Anyone who has faith will be doing what I've been doing. He will do even greater than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that, my, so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. And this is the verse where Jesus is saying, look, you can look, not only can you look like me, I will I am commanding it. Now, remember, we went through Revelations 4 and 5 for the last four weeks. And all authority in heaven and earth has been given to Christ. You know, basically, it sits under his feet. I mean, it's low, we can say Lord him. I mean, he's over it. And the, the, the Jesus Christ is over all and is all is saying, you can do what I have been doing. I don't know, besides his death and resurrection, I don't know if there's been a greater promise given by the absolute authority than Jesus Christ to say, you can do what I'm doing. And he gives that to us. And, and then he goes on, we can look at John, he goes on with it, John 14, 15 through 17, where he's like, well, how can this be possible? How can we do what you're doing? And he's, he, without them asking that, he knows what they're thinking. If you love me first, you'll keep my commandments, and I'll ask the Father, and he'll give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. So Jesus is like, it's not just my word that gives you the authority to do it. I'm giving you something else. I'm giving you the Holy Spirit. What else can he say to tell us that we can do what he says is true? There's nothing else. I mean, there's nothing else he can do. I'm going to die as he resurrects. He gives us the Holy Spirit, and he gives us his word. Is there, are you all in, though? Do you truly believe it? Well, <laughs> For some reason, my, my computer is now calling Linda. I don't know why. <laughs> Um, now, part of it is, I think, we don't stay in touch with Christ and the Father. We, it, it, it's interesting. I, I, now, I can go to prayer. Because remember, everything Jesus asked of the Father, he did. Now, why does this happen? Because he knew the Father, and he did what the Father 
told him to do. So, of course, if the father's telling him, the father's going to fulfill what he's called to do. So maybe pencils don't move and people aren't healed because we're not listening to the father. We, what we want, we'll be listening to the father. Because Christ said, remember, I'm in the father, the father's in me. I'm leaving you the spirit. We're one. You have contact with the father. Like I can pray, Lord, you know, you need to make my wife more understanding. And my God's response could be, yeah, Jim, maybe if you're less judgmental, you'd see that she is more understanding. We'll do one prayer, and then God can come back with a different prayer. I was with a person who has been praying for healing, and they're asking, why is God not healing me? I said, well, maybe you got the wrong prayer going. And they're like, what do you mean I have the wrong prayer going? And I'm like, well, God, uh, Charles Spurgeon, the, the great theologian, struggled with depression his whole life. God didn't heal it. The Apostle Paul had a thorn in his side. God never healed it. I said, that wasn't the right prayer. Matter of fact, when after Paul's third time of praying, he stopped praying it. And that's when we learned, he says, in my weakness, I am made strong. And I told him, and I was talking to the person, I said, well, maybe you need to pray to be strong in your weakness. I said, because if we're listening to the Father, he's going to tell us what the answer is. I said, Jesus knew what the Father wanted. I mean, I, the disciples had tapped into this. I, I love the story of Peter and John going to the gate beautiful. And there's all these people who are you know, sick and crippled and having issues. But they knew which one to talk to. They knew which person God was going to heal. And Peter walks up to that lame person and tells him to rise up and walk. And so he says, no, silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give to thee in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And the man gets up and walks. And he, he, his prayer is, Lord, if you would want to heal this guy, we ask for you to heal him. We know you're a God of healing. And if it's your will, you know, please heal his legs. Let him walk. Instead, Peter walks up and says, rise, hey, take your mat, rise up and walk. And he rises up and he walks. He goes, so you went walking and he went leaping and went praising God. Why? Because Peter was in touch with the Father and the Father told him, that's the one I'm going to heal. So when he actually, he's, there's no, he's not, Peter isn't the faith healer. Peter's just like, well, God said it, so you're healed. Because God said it, you're healed. And I'm like, what a relationship with God. Oh, my goodness. What a relationship with God. That he would know that precisely with that confidence. I'm like, that's just amazing. And if you, the one reason people are attracted to Jesus and to the, and they're attracted to the disciples who showed Jesus is these guys were all in. I mean, you don't take that type of harassment and persecution if you're part of them. They're like, man, these guys are onto something. No, they're onto something that seems to be real because they're willing to give everything for it. And they're seeing something there they do not see in this world. And they want it. And some are afraid of it, and some hate him. I mean, some hate, hate Jesus because, well, you're taking away our authority. And it's right, I am taking away your authority. It's God's the authority, not you. He's the authority. But we like being partial in. In 1 John 1, 5, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all and if we're in christ there's not supposed to be any darkness in, in us in john 3 19 and 21 this is the verdict light has come into the world but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil everyone does evil hates the light it will not come into the light for fear of what their that their deeds will be exposed but whoever lives by the truth and comes into light so it may be seen plainly that they have done what they have done has been done in the sight of god If we walk in the light, he is the light. He is in that light. We have fellowship with one another in the blood of Jesus and the Son cleanses us from all. We don't walk in darkness. We're supposed to be walking in light. And all I'm seeing in our world and in our government is a whole lot of darkness and people trying to make the darkness light. And I'm like, this is this is a joke. This is a joke. And it's amazing the millions of people who line up 
behind this political stuff that is just breeding darkness. And God's like, Jesus like, I'm the light. And this world needs a light. And if you are the light, darkness will never be in you. That's like, you know, you put a, when you make cockroach scatter, you put the lights on and they scatter. Christians in the light are going to make people scatter. <laughs> not because they're trying to do it, but the darkness does not like Jesus. Will not embrace Jesus and will do everything it can to attack Jesus. And the light has an amazing way of doing that. I, and when you see people do it, when bring the light, it's amazing. And, but we also have, we have trouble bringing light we, to people. And uh, the book I'm reading about Jesus, this guy who's writing, is uh, the guy is fascinating. He spends a lot of time with Muslims and Jews and just loving on them. And he says, I was at a, he says, I was at a uh, coffee shop, and this guy's walking down the street, and he's carrying a cross. He has a bullhorn. He's yelling. All the perverts, gays, and Catholics are going to hell. And I'm like, oh, he's like, oh, dear Lord. And someone went outside and punched the guy in the mouth. And I'm like, and the guy gets up and says, well, if you're not being persecuted for God, you're not doing it right. And, and I'm like, uh, this is not how God does it. But the, the guy's sitting there like, why do we do stuff? Why do we always go to the darkness or to the, the tough stuff? Or the, he goes, like, people, he goes, Love, he, I'm on the same boat with him. Where he says, why do people start with, you're going to hell, you don't have to. Jesus is love. There's so many wonderful things about that. But instead of going to that and sharing this wonderful love, we have to start with, you're going to hell, you don't have to. So we go to the fear side instead of the love side. And so he, he's telling a story. He goes, yeah, he goes, I was with this, um, he goes, I was doing this. Bible study, well, because I was doing a study with all Muslims, and we're going through the book of Luke, and they're not Christians, they're Muslims. He says, I'm just sitting there, and we're talking Luke, we're discussing Luke, and I'm loving it, and, and this guy walks in and says, this guy thinks Jesus Christ is the Savior. Do you realize who you're talking to? And the guy said, I've learned in those situations to say absolutely nothing, and that's control. And so he says nothing. He said, it seemed like there was silence for eternity. He says, probably five seconds. He said, and then one of the guys, one of the Muslims says, you know something? We were having a great time talking about, the, about Luke until you got here. So why don't you either join us or leave? And I thought, that's God in action. This is guy just sharing Luke, not trying, because I don't sit there trying to convert them. Not my job. That's the Holy Spirit's job. I'm just sharing the love of Jesus Christ with them and the love he has for us and how he cares for us. And he said, and one of the gentlemen, he said, I don't call, he goes, I don't call myself a Christian. He says, because it's too much negative. They say, what are you? He goes, I follow Jesus. I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm not a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. He goes, it's just a term I prefer. And so I'm at this house and this, this guy and I were talking and, you know, he's Muslim and he's like, well, you're one of those Christian guys. And his wife walks in. As his wife walks in, he says, do you have any kids? And his wife, oh, yes, we do. He said, tell me about your children. They have two children, so they start talking about th their children and having a great time. And all of a sudden, guy says, you didn't answer my question. You're a Christian, aren't you? He said, well, I don't want to get into that. He said, why? He said, you want me to talk doctrine. I don't want to talk doctrine. <laughs> it's silly. But if you want to talk about this wonderful man named Jesus who has shown me amazing love, I'll, I'll talk about him. But I'm not here to convert you. I'm not here to do theology. And he said, we got into a half-hour discussion <laughs> about the love of Jesus. It was just a half hour of how, how loving he is. And he says, when I got done, he said, can we meet again? And he said, yes. Anytime you like. And I just love that approach. Now, people who use a different approach, it's fine. But we're missing how loving and wonderful Jesus is. Because what does he want for us? He wants us to have life and has it to the fullest. And too many Christians think eternity happens after we die. It happens now. It's happening now. And life to the fullest is in him learning about him and having him real in us. And it comes down to a choice. 
We're either going to choose the light or we're not. And that's really what it comes down. It's not tricky. We choose Jesus or we don't. We choose the light or we don't. That's just up to us. There's, I mean, when we choose light, the marriages are stronger. The church is stronger. We move down the narrow road joyfully. And there's a contentment. When darkness tries to stop us, when darkness comes to make trouble for us and terrible things happen, we have a contentment because we're in the light and we know it's right. And it's, the church becomes powerful not because of the music and not because of the preacher. The church is powerful is the gathering of believers who are all in for Jesus. Who have that tenacity to just keep going. And th- also, especially when things look awful. They just keep going. Because they know the end game. They know how it's going to end. And we realize we have too important of a job to say, oh, okay, this isn't going well, so let's just bail and go on to the next thing. There's just too much that has to be done. And the last thing, he says, how, Jesus says you can do greater things than these. And people are like, what does that mean? I said, oh, it's very, very simple. See, Jesus wasn't dead and resurrected yet. The greater thing we get to do is tell people about his death and resurrection. He was telling what he was going to do. We live on the side that he has already done it. That's the greatest thing we'll ever do, is let people know about that love and the price he paid for us. But we can do what he has done. I don't know if Christians really believe that. I mean, they love to believe it when it's, I want a million dollars, and I want to never get sick. And you say, okay, you don't know me. But do we really believe we can do what Jesus has done? Because he has given us the Holy Spirit. But it always comes down to, are we all in? Are we all in for Christ? Not just the words, but the life we live and the way we deal with things. Are we dealing with things the way Jesus dealt with things? Years ago, there was that saying, what would Jesus do? Which really, I understand that the intent was great. But I'm like, why, was, why, that was, why wasn't it, what did Jesus do? Let's just do what Jesus did. Or Mike likes, what will Jesus do? Because he tells us what he's going to do. When he said, what would, I have to put in what I think. And as soon as I put in what I think Jesus would do, we're on a bad road. <laughs> as soon as it's what I think he would do, we're in trouble. It comes down, what did he do? What is he telling us he's going to do? That's just where we need to live. We live there. We'll know how to handle situations. We'll know how to handle difficult people. We're going to know how to handle things that go terribly wrong. Because we're just going to follow Jesus' lead and do what he did. And so and the wonderful thing is we don't have to do one thing he did. We don't have to be crucified. He died for us while we're still sinners. He gave up all for us. He gave up his life so we could have life. He gave his life so we can have life. What a beautiful thing. We come to his table, confessing our sins, because he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we come to him, we bring our sins to him, we seek forgiveness, and he forgives. Lord, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you that how much you, what you've done for us. We thank you that you gave us a promise we can be like you because it's your spirit in us. It's not us. It's your spirit in us. It's you in us, your, the Father working in us, and you're telling us what to do, and we do it. It's going to be done because everything you says gets done, gets done. We're allowed to have that relationship with you. We're allowed to be that close to you. How blessed are we? Lord, maybe understand that relationship and walk towards it. Maybe walk towards you, hearing the things we do not want to hear, because truth is sometimes not something we want to hear, but it's what we have to hear. Your truth always lights the path. Your truth brings a healing and gives us life to the fullest. Let's take this bread, take this cup, proclaiming you as our Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen.